check in real quick. I had a little bit of a problem in the A15 service. Can you hear that okay? to have you here with us uh, both on uh, on YouTube and Facebook as well as those of you that are in the pews. Uh, we want to remind you that because we are uh, doing these worship services live on YouTube and Facebook that we just remember that you are on air. Uh, it's so uh, we hear all of your beautiful voices and everything else like that and we want that to be happening. The, uh, the, the biggest thing that we want you to remember is, is that uh, we our prayer concerns, our joys and concerns, we are asking congregants to call us during the week or to text us during the week so that we can use the ones that we've gotten permission for uh, as we put those on YouTube, on Facebook, because we have to do those in a different way because um, we can't just do it from the floor. It's got to have permission from the families in order for us to announce those things. It's just one of those issues of courtesy. Uh, I, want, I want you all to kind of look around the building. You know, normally we don't have... Uh, time machines in our sanctuary and gears along the walls and things of that nature. But we had our vacation Bible school last week. Had a little, uh, o- almost 34 kids at the height of it. Uh, I-, I just have to say thank you, thank you, thank you to all of those that donated to, to the vacation Bible school experience. Uh, Sarah made a wish list, and within less than two weeks, the entire wish list was completely full. Could not have done it without your support. Uh, We also want to say thank you to the Christian Education Committee for uh, everything that you did to help Sarah make that happen, as well as all the volunteers, all of our storytellers, uh, all of those that helped with crafts. It was absolutely an amazing experience, but I think that we really need to applaud Sarah if we have the opportunity, like right now. Uh, she, She worked tirelessly to make it happen, and with that being said, she is not allowed to be in the office tomorrow or Tuesday. We are not allowed to call her Monday or Tuesday. Uh, we wanted to take a moment to rest and, and, and bask in the, the joy of trying to do a vacation Bible school in the middle of a pandemic, which was weird. And it's the first time I'd ever thought that we would have a thermometer checking people's temperatures as they walk in the door. Uh, and it was, it, was, it was cool. I mean, we, we did it based off of everything that our local hospital administrators and uh, people that are nurses and doctors told us to do, and it it worked very well. Uh, Also want to continue to encourage you that uh, as we start to meet in person, as 
Uh, we we want to encourage those that wear masks and to sanitize and things of nature when we're in groups of people. But at the same time, uh, we're just glad that you're here. Uh, without me speaking any more, I want to. We have a special uh, announcement. Yes, Doctor? Ah, Kevin, there you are. Look at this machine. We had some fun times this week, didn't we? We sure did, Doctor. What was your favorite? Oh, man, I was thinking of when David came and told you and told you and about his, how he stood about his faith, and he had you fooled thinking he was a big warrior, but instead he was a little kid, and he had a lot to offer. Wait, Kevin, how... That's a good way. How did you know? You weren't even there. Or when Joseph came and talked about forgiveness, his bro forgiving his brothers even when they did bad things to him. God used Joseph for amazing things and opened their hearts to forgiveness. Kevin, how do you know? You weren't there. How could you possibly? Or when Daniel came and, and encouraged us to fight for our faith and stand our ground. Kevin, you weren't there. How do you... You weren't there. How would you know? Or when the time Esther came and told us how she had made a brave choice for standing up for her people. God was with all these people's people and is with us. Kevin, you weren't, well, wait a second. You were there for that one. You're, I mean, you're right. You weren't there for the other three, but you were there for the, the last one. I don't know where you went, but that's fine. You the, mean, the point is... God does amazing things with amazing people, right? Even you, Doctor. Oh, well, thank you, Kevin. So now, since we're not taking over the world anymore, we can get rid of the time machine. I'm sad about that. It's very hard. But we can now create something for God. What about our plan to re reimagine the la laboratorium? Ooh, that's a good idea. We can create this laboratorium where you get cheap stuff to make this stuff. And we can somehow make it for God. Let's go, Kevin. Yes. Good morning. A lot of people aren't aware, but there's recently been a study of our hymnal, and we've discovered that there are certain hymns that are directed toward or for certain people or certain occupations. So we have a little quiz this morning to see if we can come up with uh, the hymn when I give you the category of the occupation or the person. And our first one is a massage therapist. He touched me. Our second one is a dentist. Come on, let's think here. Crown him with many crowns. Larry, good job. Good job, Larry. <clears throat> Our third one is for shoppers. Now, this could be in person or online, either one. In the sweet by and by. Ooh, that's not. Fourth one would be for politicians. No. Standing on the promises. And our last one <clears throat> is for IRS agents. I surrender all. <clears throat> so I guess you could kind of think of it now that that's where we are in our service. It's time for us now to surrender our attention in our hearts and prepare for worship.
Would you please stand and join me for the call to worship our opening prayer and our opening hymn. We gather in this place having made it through another week. We gather as human beings the garden of our lives continue to grow weeds. Weeds of strife and discontent. May God inspire growth in our lives and make us fruitful. Let us worship the Lord of the harvest with all our hearts, mind, and soul. Please join me in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We come to and surrender our concerns. We surrender our hearts. We surrender our thoughts that we may focus on you and to learn more of you, and to worship you. Be with us as we continue that we may gain a deeper understanding of you and how you would have us live our lives. These things we ask in your son's name. Amen. Please join me in the opening hymn, number 699, Rejoice, the Lord is King. Rejoice, the Lord is King, the risen Christ adore. Rejoice, give thanks and sing and triumph evermore. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again. I say rejoice, God's reign can never Again, we, we, uh, we now come to that time of our service where we lift up our joys and concerns together as friends and as family. Again, these are the lists of names that we um, uh, have previously gotten before we started worship this morning. And so I'm going to read through the list, and at the end we will collectively remind ourselves that God in your mercy, we would say, hear our prayer. So we uh, got word that Betty Dillon's skin graft is, is doing well, and everything seems to be going well. Uh, she still has some consultation as to what kind of surgery they will be having in the future. Uh, her grandson, Xavier, uh, is in Chicago at boot camp and uh, contracted COVID. And so did most of the guys that were in the boot camp with him. So they are quarantined during boot camp in Chicago away from everyone until the quarantine is over and then they get to start back up with all the fun and excitement that boot camp has to offer. Uh, so we lift him up as well. Uh, Tex Shelton is uh, continuing to progressively get better, but uh, they're still waiting on some major tests and some major treatment and asked us to continue to pray for Tex Shelton and also Velma as she's taking care of all of these things and her family in the midst of all of that. Her, uh, they just asked that we pray for their great-granddaughter Harper as well as their grandson Thomas. We want to be with the family of Becky Beckner in the, uh, as they celebrate the life of Becky's mother Esther who passed away this last week and ask that you just kind of reach out and make a phone call, send her a card, let her know that we're thinking about her. Um, 
And we also continue to pray for the Anderson family, specifically Jacob, who's been diagnosed with lymphoma, uh, who's 26 years old. Um, Cecil Loveless is continuing to progressively get better, and so is Joyce, and they just wanted us to say thank you. We ask that you continue to pray for Shirley Self and the, and the loss of her husband, Manuel, um, and as well as the family of Curly Foster and Mrs. Upchurch. Um, we ask that you keep Larry Voice in your prayers, who's continuing to recuperate from his surgery, as well as Norma Hughes and all of her children. J.D. Coe's sister is continuing to recuperate and just asks us to pray for her. Luke Geisinger had surgery and then had surgery again on the other eye and is, is doing well. Uh, Marilyn Brannon uh, had a lumpectomy this last week from her breast cancer, and everything went perfect, is what the doctor said. Uh, she's doing quite well, and they've scheduled Leonard surgery for at a later date, but just ask that we lift them up in our prayers this morning. We again ask that you pray for Jacqueline Schwickerath, um, as well as Natalie Goldman and uh, Kenny Voss, who was burned at work uh, and uh, is, is slowly recuperating. Uh, Sarah asked for us to pray for her sister, Amanda, uh, who had carpal tunnel surgery that went well, but is now going to have to have surgery on the other wrist as well. And we also lift up Tracy and Scott Klingman. Sue, uh, this is Tracy is Sue Klingman's daughter-in-law. Uh, who has now has brain tubers and will now be undergoing a cyber knife surgery. We just Oh my goodness. Okay. We're going to pray for Tracy, Scott, and the whole family as we go through this process together. And then we ask that you pray for the family of John St. Clair. With all of these that have lift, been lifted up, God, in your mercy, let us pray. Creator of all life, in whom we find ourselves alive, and in whom we move, and hopefully in whom we have our life. We pray for courage and the ability to do well the task that you have set before us. May we be aware of your presence within each and every one of us, how your interest in our labors and your offer to turn our best into that ideal of making your kingdom come in the areas of our life in which each of us work. We pray for your ministry and to the needs of every worshiper before you. We pray that our visitors and guests may find hospitality among us in your house of inspiration, both here in this room and those joining us online. We pray that the sorrowful may meet the comforter until their darkness is penetrated by the light of hope, and that those in pain or mental anguish or in the throes of distress that we cannot see or physically change, may we, O oh God, discover an understanding of sharing one another's burdens as we pray for those that we have mentioned. We know, God, that you are the great physician and you bring healing on those that call upon you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in which we do so this morning. We lift up Betty and Zavian, Thomas and Harper, Tex and Velma, Jacob, Cecil and Joyce, Larry, Norma and her whole family, J.D.'s sister, Luke Geisinger, Leonard and Marilyn, Jacqueline, Natalie, Henny, Amanda and Tracy. We ask, O oh God, that you bring your healing hand upon them, that you give us the ability to be their strength and comfort in the days ahead. And we ask that you would help us to discover a way to break the monotony of our existence. Those days when they are as drab as winter skies. Help us to break through these dark days and help us to find a place of connection in the heavens and to experience a newly found joy 
And may we have it ennobled in a sense of peace that truly passes our understanding as we pray for those that have gone on before us. We lift up the family of Manuel Self, Esther Addington, Curly Foster, Mrs. Upchurch, and all of those that we have mentioned before. Well, God, we recognize that your care never ceases. So, God, we ask that you would incline our hearts ever nearer to you, so that having lived as faithfully as humanly possible, we may rejoice at the end of our days. And those days where shadows seem to blot out the sun, we will be greeted by life through him who brought life and immortality to life. In your son Jesus' name we pray together. Amen. At this time, we'd like to invite any of the children that would like to go to our prey ground uh, to, uh, to leave with us as we sing you out. Hit it, Nancy. The little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. I don't know what I like more. The fact that I get to say, hit it, Nancy, and she plays. Or the fact that we have this opportunity for kids to have a, a, a playground to go and, and be a part of service and still be here. This morning, my scripture is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, because we're not done with it yet. We're going to read verses 31 through 33, and then we're going to skip over to 44 through 52. Hear now these words from our Bible. He put before them another parable. He said, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in the field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree. So that the birds of the air come and make its nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like, and I want you to understand that in the Greek, it's leaven, not yeast. The word is leaven. That's important for later on. But just for our translations, it says, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid, and then in his joy he goes and sells that all he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. It's on finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out, separate the evil from the righteous, and throw them into the furnaces of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all of this? They answered, Yes. And he said to them, Therefore every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out his treasure, what is new and what is old. And just to finish this off, when Jesus had finished these parables, he left this place. May God bless the reading of God's holy scripture. Amen. What is the kingdom of heaven like? Well, it's kind of like a mustard seed. It's a little like leaven. It's, it's kind of like a hidden treasure or a pearl. 
Thank you, Jesus, for yet once again being completely and totally ambiguous. Or is he really being ambiguous? In this story, there are four many parables, but really there's five. And the writer records this, unlike the other parts that we read in the Gospel of Matthew, without explanation. Stories about what the kingdom of heaven is like. Individually, they've been dissected and analyzed and allegorized and sermonized, preached in sermon series. But what would happen just for today if we put all of them together and through the parables that we've heard, maybe there's an overarching theme about the kingdom of heaven. Maybe that's what we focus in on today. So let's start with the first one. The mustard seed. When I was, uh, I, I talked to the first worship service at 815, and I was talking to my Sunday school class, a lot of you know that I, I put a lot of stock in what the Westar Institute puts together when they talk about the historical Jesus. In the 80s, there was a, a big academic draw to figure out what were the actual red-letter versions that were what Jesus actually said versus what the publishers said that Jesus had said. And there was a lot of academic discussion, and there was a lot of things put together. And the one thing that they could almost all agree on is, is that when it's a parable, most of the time, no, no, notice how I say that, most of the time, Jesus most likely said it. And over time, those stories changed, and sometimes they became institutionalized. But in this particular passage of Scripture... This group decided that this most likely, there was four ways of voting. Red, pink, gray, and black. Red, absolutely Jesus said it without a shadow of a doubt. Pink meant he most likely said it, and the culture has very changed it very little. Gray meant the culture made the story based off of Jesus' teachings, and if it was black, it had to be unanimous. Jesus didn't say it, the church did. The very first part of this passage was pink. They believed that Jesus absolutely would have said these words. Would he have said it exactly the same? Probably not. Probably in the original form of this parable, Jesus compares heaven's imperial rule to the small mustard seed. The mustard seed is almost always discussed as being extremely small. It's actually an annual shrub, by the way. Yet in Matthew and Luke, it becomes the largest of all garden plants. In Oklahoma, we have them growing out in our plains. We look at them and say, ooh, look at that crazy looking bush. It's actually a mustard shrub. And I look at it in the same way that I would look at Oklahoman bodark. It grows like a weed and it's really hard to get rid of. It just keeps growing and growing and growing, which makes sense why they would use that, because it looks exactly the same here as it did in Israel when we saw it this in January. But in this aspect, in Matthew and Luke, it's humongous, and it eventually becomes blown up into a tree. Now, it's important to recognize that there's uh, an expansion of the understanding of the cedars of Lebanon, which we find in Ezekiel and in Daniel. It becomes a metaphor for the towering empire. It is an apocalyptic tree whose crown reaches to the heavens and its branches span the earth. Now, as Jesus you, he uses it as the image of a lowly garden plant. A weed, which is kind of a surprising figure of God's domain. Mustard seed, in, in, their, in the academic's view, is probably a parody of the, the mighty cedar of Lebanon and the apocalyptic tree of Daniel. It pokes fun at the arrogance and the aspirations connected with that Im image. For example, for Jesus, God's kingdom was a modest affair. Not obvious to the untutored eye. It offered little by the way of an earthly reward. You know, empires grow, people get wealthy. The kingdom of heaven is the kingdom of heaven. Its demands are staggering. 
He didn't want it confused with the traditional or the mundane hopes of an empire. Now, the parable of the leaven. We find that the historical Westar Institute found that basically this was absolutely Jesus' words. Because for him, it just takes a little bit of leaven and a little bit of flour and all you have to keep doing is adding flour because a little bit of heaven goes a long way, right? So here, they absolutely, categorically voted that this was absolutely Jesus' word. Now the other three, the hidden treasure suggests a joyful discovery uh, because invasion and marauding thieves made the burying of valuables a common practice. So if I find treasure here, if I buy the field, maybe I'll find more. Note that the sheer joy of discovering something so valuable that all other possessions become expendable to buy this field that contains the treasure. You could start to see where this kind of changes the way that we look at this scripture in such a way that this is the Word of God talking about possessions, where Jesus himself would say, what? Sell all of your possessions, come and follow me. So the, the parable of the pearl is almost identical to the parable of the treasure. Now the fishing net, well, it's a little bit more complex, and it contains a lot of ideas of the final judgment. When the angels separate those that are good and those that are bad, and those that it's my favorite, one of my favorite statements of burning in the fires of the furnace fire, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, and bad things are going to happen, and ah, oh, you can hear it, right? It's it's almost as if he's screaming to them what's going on. But it's also important to notice that it's central to Matthew Matthew's theology. That this idea is not about what we do today that matters, right? It matters to God in a timeless way. What we do today matters for us and the ways that we treat others, but for God today is just the blink of an eye. All five of these parables deal with the element of surprise, the runt of the seed world. The mustard seed becomes the greatest of shrubs, a tiny amount of leaven can leaven many loaves. A person unexpectedly finds treasure. A merchant finds a pearl and a fisherman hauls in an ex unexpected amount of fish. It gives us hope to think, well, the king, what is the kingdom of heaven like? Well, it's kind of like When I was in youth ministry, I remember asking the kids one time to sit down and write their own gospel. Because I don't believe the story stopped at this point. And I remember the kids sitting down to talk about what the kingdom of heaven would look like. And it started off really simple like, well, the kingdom of heaven has a lot of really cool roller coasters. The kingdom of heaven has a lot of really neat things there. We don't ever have to worry about cleaning the dishes, taking out the trash, mowing the lawn. It's, it's the greatest thing in the whole wide, our imagination, right? And I, at the time I thought, wow, that's really cool. I, I don't know if I want to ride the roller coasters. You know, heavenly roller coasters mean they go extremely high. And as I got older, you know, you have that inner ear thing that doesn't make roller coasters as fun as they used to be. But what happened next, as these children preached to me, changed my whole concept. And they said, Josh, but the kingdom of heaven is also like the fact that no one is ever sick. No one's ever angry. That no one ever is struggling with life. No one goes hungry. I remember very clearly them saying, there will be an end to mourning and to weeping 
and pain. Because it's totally new, Josh. Don't you know this? And I remember looking at them going, wow, you all paid attention in Sunday school. And they said, oh, really? That's in the Bible? Yeah, I failed. And I remember thinking to adults as I was telling them this story about how beautiful it was that these kids had this total idea of what the kingdom of heaven was like. And the reality came to my mind that it wasn't necessarily about the end of time. Jesus didn't want us to focus in on what happens after we die. Jesus wanted us to focus in on how do we create the kingdom of heaven while we're alive. How do we create the kingdom of heaven here on earth? How do we embrace the aspects of humanity in such a way that allows for people to agree to disagree? How do we create an environment where people are loved even if they disagree with the way we think? Oh, that's crazy. You mean not everyone thinks the same way as I do? Thank God for that. In the parable of the mustard seed, what aspects of Jesus' own ministry might have seemed small? At the time, you can imagine these people hearing these words, and he even asks them, do you understand this? It's just why I said it the way I did it. Because you know that they're going to say, they could do it a couple ways. Like when I was teaching, I can remember this conversation happening all the time. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, Mr. Bell. Which usually means, I'm tired of you talking about it, Mr. Bell. We've heard about it ten times. Or they'd say, yes, Mr. Bell, because it was the very first time they'd ever heard it, and it's like this light bulb popped up in their head, and then there was the, uh, yes, Mr. Bell? I think that's more of the answer here. When Jesus asks them, do you understand what's going on? They're like, um, yes. We understand the story, but we don't exactly know what it means for us. See, sometimes we focus so much on the things of earth that we forget that our job here on earth is to focus on things of God. And all of the earthly things that seem to suck us into it, we're supposed to turn a blind eye towards it. Remember last week I kept saying, get thee behind me, Satan. Every time that the things of the world come into our mind, we are to put our mind away from those things and focus in on the things of God. Like hidden treasures. How do you find a hidden treasure? A lot of us have had opportunities to clean out our garages. And in those garages, we keep the things that are valuable to us, right? We do it so that we can get them in and out as quickly as possible. For me, that's where my motorcycle is. It's now covered up in cardboard boxes, but that's a whole other story for another day. But if I want it, I know I can open up the door and I can take it and I can ride it and I feel like it's part of me, right? But then there's the aspect of where we put our storage. Right? These are the things that mean something to us, but they don't mean enough for us that we can get to them safely or quickly. We get a storage unit or we put them into storage because we might need them a little bit later. We don't do that with Jesus at all, do we? How often do the things that Christ has taught us end up in storage? Then we have to look at verses 44 through 46. We have to ask ourselves, what is the value of the kingdom of heaven? Well, on here on earth, it's nothing. The kingdom of heaven is not something you can put a price tag on. It's not something that somebody can go and see on the shelves or find it online and purchase it and they, I got my ticket, I'm on my way. The kingdom of heaven is something that we have to do today, tomorrow, and recognizing that we're going to fail miserably every single time that we try to make it our kingdom. Our kingdom. When you look at verses 24 through 30, when we talked about the parable of the weeds, when the, 
the, hu- the, the, the good will be separated with from the bad. And then it's written again in the fissures of the net, right? It's, it's talking about the good will be separated from the bad. But guess what? That's not something that you are in charge of. Matthew is very clear that that's something that God takes care of. So then what is the value of that passage for us? It says that you have to be worried about your own journey enough that it doesn't affect the others. It's so easy for us, like I said last week, to point a finger and and not realize that there's three pointing right back at us. It's so easy for us in today's culture especially to say we're right and you're wrong or you're wrong and I'm right. And all day long there's this constant battle between what is God and what is earth. And then I am reminded from the words of our children, what is the kingdom of heaven like? Well, Josh, if you don't know, why do we have to tell you? You're the preacher. The kingdom of life is like, heaven is like this, Josh. It's simple. There is no pain. There is no sorrow. There is no grief. And it looks as small as a mustard seed, but Josh, you know how big it really is, right? You can hear the kids speaking to you in the midst of all of this thing. What does the kingdom of heaven look like? Ask a child. Jesus is very clear about that. So at the end of the day, we find ourselves asking the question, what does the kingdom of heaven look like? The kingdom of heaven looks like this. And it looks like that. The kingdom of heaven looks like this. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In a, in a world that is rich and abundant, God's blessings include talents, skills, opportunities, and strengths that enable you to provide for your own needs and those of others. All that you have first comes from the Lord. In much the same way as he sent the sun and the rain to provide for your needs, he entrusts you as a steward of all earthly things. There is great opportunity and joy in managing his wealth and using and wisely using Christ as the ultimate model for selfless generosity. Would the deacons please come forward? stand for the doxology.
tithes and offerings. We ask you to guide and direct us to use this to glorify your name. Amen. There are a lot of forces in this world that are seeking to separate us. We're physically separated, or sometimes we should be, as we provide safety and social distance from the virus that haunts us. We have to be honest about it and call it out that we see our world separated by race and how pe whites and people of color are at odds on how to best honor all lives. We are spiritually separated as we struggle to reconcile our faith and our freedom. I mean, even Paul says in Romans that nothing can separate us from God's love, but we continue to separate ourselves from each other. Now, folks, the communion table becomes the salve that heals all wounds. And the glue that binds us back together. It's through the gift of the bread and the cup that we are remembered as Christ's body and no, le no longer separated by distance or skin color or theology. Even Paul says, no Jew, no Greek, no free, nor slave. There is so much on which we cannot agree, but we know this. God is bigger than any of our disagreements. And God is working to find ways for us to knit us back together. And when we take these elements, we are claiming our place in Christ's body alongside those with whom we are in solidarity, but also and ultimately claiming our place alongside with whom we disagree. Those who oppose us, those who speak different spiritual languages than us. You see, division is nothing new for God. God has been grieving our separation since Adam and Eve ate the fruit. And yet, Paul reminds us, if God is for us, who can be against us? Not even we have the power to undo what God has done at this table. Let us share this communion together. Join me in hymn number 425. Let us break bread together. Let us break bread together on our
remember those stories that Paul tells us, that on the night that Jesus was in an open room with his disciples, he took a loaf of bread, blessed it, broke it, saying that this is my body given for you. Take this and eat it in remembrance of me. And likewise, he took a pitcher of wine that he shared amongst his friends and disciples, saying that this is my blood which has been shed for you. As often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you do so in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Please bow your head and pray with me. Heavenly Father, as we prepare to partake of this Holy Communion, we pray that you would forgive our sins and that you would cleanse our hearts and minds. We also pray for the doctors and the laboratory people trying to find something for a cure for this terrible COVID. We pray for the doctors and nurses, especially those on the front line that have been for six months now have had basically no lives to the, of their own. We pray for our, the EMTs and our military, and we pray all these prayers in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Now let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our, Our Father, Father, who Lord art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our, our trespasses, trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now take this bread as the bread of life. And as we drink this cup, let us remember that we drink this cup as it's been given for the gifts of God for the people of God. So we now come to that time of our service where we invite those that would like to make their profession of faith, for those that would like to take this moment an opportunity to rededicate themselves for a life of walking in Jesus' footsteps. We invite you all to stand together and sing uh, as we sing our closing hymn. Number. O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, save that Thou art. Though my best thoughts, by day or by night, waking or sleeping, Thy presence my light. Be Thou my wisdom, and Thou Almighty God, as we leave this place, we ask that you be with us as we go out into the world, preaching and teaching in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. We ask all of this and ask that you continue to be with us and guide us always. Amen. Amen. Amen.